Good afternoon, Free From An Allergy community. I am so excited to welcome another special guest to our virtual show series for Celiac Awareness Week. So Dr. Kim Faulkner-Hogg is an advanced accredited practicing dietitian and member of the Dietitians Association of Australia. Kim completed her PhD in celiac disease and the gluten-free diet in 2004. For over 25 years, sorry, Kim has worked with specialised doctors and dietitians at the Allergy Unit, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Sydney, gaining extensive experience with celiac disease and the gluten-free diet, dietary investigations for food triggers in adults with food intolerances, non-celiac gluten intolerances, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms, hives, headaches, and more. She also lectures to the nutrition and dietetic students at the universities of Sydney and Wollongong. She has been invited speaker at events for the public, doctors, nurses, dietitians, and food industry groups on celiac disease and food intolerances. Kim has published her research in scientific journals, written articles for general practice, doctor journals, and the Australian Celiac Magazine. She's also co-authored several booklets for use with patients and written forwards or introductions to books on recipe books on celiac disease, which are available to the public. So with my great pleasure, I am so excited to introduce Dr. Kim Faulkner-Hogg, who has such an extensive experience and knowledge with celiac disease. Thank you, Lauren. It's great for you to invite me. I'm very, very happy to talk to you today and um, let's see where we go with, with this topic. Definitely. So I guess my first question for you is, can you tell us about yourself and what brought you to actually obtain your PhD in celiac disease? Uh, so I grew up in Queensland. I wanted to be Margot Fontaine II. So I went down um, a big ballet route for, for many, many years, but that wasn't going to be. So um, I changed my focus. My mother was the one who was always very interested in nutrition. And um, we grew up uh, with brown bread, brown rice, brown pasta, when basically wasn't on the shelves. Um, and mum used to make her own yogurt because she couldn't buy that. She would make her own muesli because that was never even heard of. So I had this strong influence from my mum to move into nutrition. So um, when ballet was falling through, I went, okay, well, I will do my science degree with the idea that I'll go on and do dietetics, which was a postgrad degree at that um, time. And um, then I, you know, married my husband. We, we traveled overseas with his job um, before we came back to Australia. And I got a, a job at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Um, and I worked there at the allergy unit. And the allergy unit is not just food allergies, but there's a lot of food intolerances. Uh, which is distinctly different to, to a food um, allergy reaction. And we, at the time, had a number of clients who came through, let's say about you know five, a handful of clients come through who had celiac disease. And they said, do not tell me that I am eating gluten. I am got it all out of my diet because the food standards at that point had a little bit that dribbled in and that was considered to be gluten-free. They said, all of that's gone. I still have symptoms. And everyone just says you're eating gluten. And so we treated them not like these symptoms were from celiac disease, but there were other food contributors that were non-gluten uh, related. And we put them onto that particular uh, food chemical intolerance diet and we were able to show that they did have symptoms. And then we actually continued as well um, the, the whole project looking then at celiac disease and what these really, really tiny amounts of gluten did. And we looked at groups because we the food standard was changing at that time. So we were able to capture it coming out of the diet. So we were measuring well, what did it do at the biopsy two years down the track and what did it do sort of to symptoms as that went past. And so I got involved with um, this whole area and um, Graham and Cheryl Price uh, at the Celiac Society of New South Wales, which was also um, the Celiac Society of Australia at that point in time. Um, and Graham particularly he, um, mentored me and took me under his wing and, and you know, explained an awful lot. So that's how I got involved in it and I just find it fascinating. It's, it's quite complex, isn't it? Like you think it's just like, oh, you're gluten-free or you're celiac, 
but it's very complex. And I know one of my questions that I'll ask later is about that whole traces and when they do say that if there's traces of gluten. But my next question then would say, can you just briefly explain the difference between celiac disease and then being gluten-free or gluten intolerant? Because I know that there that is some a bit of a confusion um, for a lot of people. Look, it's really, really important to know if you've got celiac disease. There are probably more people who are intolerant than have celiac disease. So, you know, roughly the figures in um, Australia are 70% or we can say in the Caucasian world, 1% will have celiac disease. But the figures are more like 10 to 15% are intolerant. So there are greater chances that you may be intolerant than you have celiac disease. But celiac disease has the long-term medical consequences if you don't deal with it correctly. So with celiac disease, um, I sort of say to people, you know, you swallow your food, it goes down through the esophagus, through the stomach, and then the first part it empties into is the small intestine. So think of that as a garden hose, um, which is all wound up inside of you. And around that garden hose, you've got these finger-like projections, which we call villi. And on those villi, you have uh, enzymes and other mechanisms that will grab onto the nutrients in your diet and you know, absorb it properly, get it into the bloodstream and take it to where it needs to be in the body. And if you don't have these villi then, you lose all those mechanisms to absorb your food. And so um, a lot of your nutrients will just get washed out of your system. So people who have celiac disease, the gluten that's in the food that they are eating causes these things to be damaged. Now they can be partially damaged, they can be completely damaged, which we sort of would call flat gut. And removing gluten helps these things to grow back. And it's the loss of these villi that ultimately cause a lot of the medical complications that occur for people with celiac disease. So if they're not taking the gluten out of their diet, then these will continue to be damaged, which will affect all of the nutrients that they will absorb from their, their body. Calcium is uh, you know, one example. If you're not absorbing your calcium, you will break your bones more and you'll end up with osteoporosis faster. Now, people who have a wheat intolerance, they will have a, a very similar set of symptoms to people who have celiac disease, but this part of their villi is not being damaged. So they are not losing the ability to absorb their nutrients. So they are not, you know, if they've got osteoporosis, it's not because their villi have been damaged. It may be for other reasons. So, you know, if they will, um, they can go on sort of eating foods, knowing that internally their damage is not being done. And that's why it's really important if you're suspecting wheat that we actually diagnose the celiac disease first, because once gluten comes out of the diet, it's, you, you can't diagnose it. You've got to put it back in in order to diagnose it. So if you're thinking wheat's a problem, go ahead and get tested for celiac disease first. Let's, you know, take that um, diagnosis off the board to then know that we're dealing with an intolerance. And I find it interesting because my dad actually mentioned this the other day was that what is the difference, do you reckon, from now than 20 years ago? Because I feel that a lot of people are actually intolerant to gluten or wheat now, but you didn't really hear about this 20 or so years ago. Was it just because people just thought that was their quality of life? That's just what they popped it down to? There wasn't enough research? Look, it, it's a very interesting question, and I can't say that I have the answer, but I can give a slightly different perspective because the usual answer is we've genetically modified things, we've changed the processing, we've changed the way we produce breads, which for bread will work, but that doesn't mean that the wheat's used in other ways um, uh, work in the same way that we've changed it for bread. So there's a lot of information out that is, is looking at it from that perspective. So that, that's all there, but something that uh, a lot of people don't realise uh, like I've been working in this area since the early 90s and, you know, my boss since the 80s and even the late 70s. And um, so the people that I get my training from, those doctors would always say, and Lauren, if you're my example, you've come in as the client, they'd say, now, what did your um, mother or father do, you know, to food? And how was your grandmother to food? Or how were your aunts and uncles? And so if you're in the 70s, 
we're getting, if it's your grandmother, we're going back to the early 1900s with information about their diet. And we invariably had families in whom they would say, well, look, grandma didn't speak an awful lot, but we knew she couldn't have spicy food. Or if such other family member was always on the loo after we had a particular meal, or someone would always get up from the table and have to go and lie down for an hour before they could come back. So you don't get the huge explanations that we've got today. And one of those reasons were a lot of the medical profession would say, it's in your head, go home, put your feet up um, and it'll pass, you know, take a Bex, it'll pass. So people didn't really talk about it. They were not empowered or given the, the right to talk about it. They were made to feel that there was something wrong with them but is, it existed. Um, so, you know, there's Samuel Gee back in the 1800s was looking at things that affect food. I've got this one quote that I, that I have, which goes back to um, like the, the first, second century um, AD, where they're saying, you know, food is poison for some, you know, food that many can tolerate is sheer poison for, for, for others. So you've, you've got a history where we know that there have been food reactions. But what happened at the turn of this century as well, and you know, thanks to our FODMAP group in Melbourne, is they've done an awful lot of publications around the effects of FODMAPs in diets. And, and so they've gone around the world and they've not only well published, they've got other groups involved in, in um, looking at it, but they've, they've talked to it to a lot of doctors and a lot of, of people. And so now, um, instead of being said, told it's all in your mind, you're being said, oh, all right, well, let's investigate food. And there's a whole lot of different food investigations that have popped up. So we are now not just going, it's all in your mind. We're going, there's a problem here. We don't really know exactly what that problem is or how it came about yet from a scientific perspective. We're taking away the triggers by investigating all of these other different um, avenues. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Quite amazing. Yeah. And I, I guess people, like you said, feel empowered now to talk about it. It's not embarrassing to go to a cafe and go, can I get gluten-free bread or do you use the same toaster as you do when you're toasting normal bread? Like those questions, they're just conversations now that people feel more comfortable in having. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my next question for you is that you actually helped develop the low gluten and gluten-free food standards for New Zealand and Australia. Can you share with us the process behind this? And if someone is gluten intolerant, can they still have low gluten as well? Okay. So um, a lot of people actually get surprised when I say to them that the very first food standards allowed wheat, starch and malt into a gluten-free diet. So when the very first food standards came about, um, they could only measure the total protein and so in a food which was very very highly refined like a starch that started with wheat was refined down to a starch the mechanism could only detect the total protein and so you were allowed to have and you know this is going back quite a few years I think it was 0.3 percent of um, the total protein left in a starch in order to go into a product called gluten-free which these days roughly sits at around 200 parts per million now, it was actually an Australian, Dr. John Skerritt, who was the first to develop a test that could, could actually test for the gluten content of a food. And so Australia was the first to say, right, we need to use this test then in our food standard instead of having just this, this total um, protein. And so in 1994, we changed the gluten-free food standard to include this test. So we had gastroenterologists, um, Graham Price, as I said, from the Celiac Society, um, got me involved, so dietitians. Um, he himself was a, a, a chemist, so we had food chemists, and the food chemists would talk about how um, sensitive these tests were, how good they were. So the test was developed to detect a particular component of wheat gluten. And, you know, I think we'll probably get to questions later where we'll discuss gluten, but gluten isn't one entity, it does change. And so this test is made for wheat gluten. And the rye and the barley are, are similar enough that it can do a pretty good job with those particular components. But once you refine barley down to malt, it gets a bit iffy. And oats is completely different. Oats doesn't even have that component that the wheat gluten is testing. 
you know, oats, you've actually got 92 to 95 percent of people with celiac disease tolerating. So it's a completely different entity. Um, and so oats and the anything from the barley malt extract, we just said can't go into a food because you can't actually detect it correctly. So you know, dietitian um, doctors were looking at what the research was available in the 90s to say where they felt it was going. And the best test at that point, its lower limit that it could detect was 30 parts per million. So that was 1994, 95. By the time we got to about 98, 99, we were, we were down to about 20 parts per million. Um, by the turn of the century, we were up to about five to 10 parts per million. And by about 2005, we're down to about three to five parts per million. Now we can probably go a little bit lower at this point, but you're starting to get, there's always a little bit of, of tiny bit of error that may come in. So we're just sort of holding the official thing at three to five parts per million um, is what we're calling gluten-free. So three parts per million here in Australia. Uh, so I guess, if can the community feel safe if something is labelled gluten-free that it is gluten-free and if you're celiac you can have it yes look there's a lot of research which is looking at um not only symptoms but what happens at the biopsy level mm -hmm. and look australia's got the strictest standard in the world and the way that came about is really well if it affects somebody you know one person then we're not going to put it into communal gluten-free food Whereas um, a lot of the other countries, they've got, you can call it gluten-free at 20 parts per million, which is absolutely minuscule. The, the 20 parts per million is designed to keep a day's worth of food. So if you, if you were to buy your pasta labelled at 20 parts per million, your breakfast cereal labelled at 20 parts per million, your um, bread labelled at 20 parts per million and your crackers at 20 parts per million in a day, mm -hmm. your total intake would be less than 10 milligrams per day of gluten, which is a couple of crumbs that you might find from a toast sort of in, in yeah. the butter. And there is research that suggests that you need 50 milligrams per day regularly, not one day. One tiny little intake of gluten does not wipe the gut free you may get terrible symptoms. The terrible symptoms doesn't equate to completely damaged gut. Yeah. Okay. You may not even notice that there's any, if a gastro went in, he probably wouldn't notice there was a change in the gut because of course you can't just lay it flat and examine the whole <laughs> There may be a little bit that, that's damaged, but you're not, you know, you're not wiping it out. So the idea is it's this consistent tiny amount in the background that is going to not allow that, that gut to heal. So 50 parts per million has been, you know, deemed what we shouldn't be eating. But there is still research that says 100 parts per million for some is fine. There's a big, well, we're talking a small range, but yeah. there's, there's a range of differences in what people experience. Um, so what we've done is say, right, if 50 is not good, 10 is what, we, so we brought it backwards and say 10 is the max. And so 10 is what um, the Europeans, the Americans, the Canadians work on, except there's a research paper out of um, Europe that says 95% of the food that they tested that was labelled gluten-free could actually be sold here in Australia under our three parts per million food standard. So again, don't think just because you're overseas, everything's got to be up with a very small amount of detectable gluten. And saying that, I really really people need to feel safe when they're traveling and they can travel overseas. We're really talking particles here. That, that's the difference. And as I said, the majority of it would fit our food standard anyway. And I think that's a really important point as well that you mentioned that it's got to be consecutively over a period of time for it to do significant damage. Because there are that you get anxious and I'm, I'm myself, I'm not celiac. Um, I have a gluten intolerant. Um, but I could only imagine if I were celiac, how worried and anxious that that could bring. If, you know, you've, you've seen what it's done in the past and how much pain you've been in, you're like, I don't want to go down that path again. Um, so, yeah, so there's always that uncertainty. And I know whenever you're traveling, especially if you're trying to go to Italy and places like that, that has amazing food, it can be quite a bit of a nervous um experience for and you one thing you can think of is if you find an international product on a food shelf here in australia mm. it has to be labeled under our food standard so that will basically tell you if they're doing that then that's 
that's kind of what they're doing for their whole product. So if you're traveling overseas, you know, get the shards, get the one that you get here because you know that it's going to be um, suitable when you're traveling as well. Yeah. Well, I guess th that leads on to my next question is when it does say there may be traces of gluten, what does this mean? So if you are celiac disease and it says gluten-free, but then it says may have traces of um, gluten, is that an, a no product or...? Right. If the product is actually labelled gluten-free, then it won't have a sta any statement that says it may have traces of gluten because that counter uh, it, it productive to the fact that they've labelled it gluten-free. But what you might find in a product labelled gluten-free is an ingredient that says wheat glucose syrup. So, I mean, I find this is a difference between those who are intolerant and those who have celiac disease because, um, well, I have to say the, re the referrals to dietitians for celiac disease is still poor, but let's say you're probably more likely to have spoken to a dietitian with celiac disease than if you are wheat intolerant because most people tend to just go ahead and do something themselves. People don't leave my office until I teach them how to read a food label. And so the people with celiac disease would walk out knowing that wheat derived glucose syrup contains no detectable gluten. And therefore that as an ingredient can be labeled gluten free. So when I see my weed intolerant people, again, I make a point of telling them how to read a food label for gluten because they don't have to avoid even, they could even have a piece of bread if they wanted to. It's about how much symptom they're prepared to look after. So they in no way need to avoid gluten to the same degree that somebody with celiac disease does. And that is a message that is confused and it's not out there. So I'm gone off topic, but this is no, a no, no. sort of thing for me because being in the 90s, starting before wheat became an issue, which was really sort of a, a 2000 issue, um, you didn't have every man and his dog avoiding everything. There's a little bit of a confusion between the way you treat an allergy and the way you would treat an intolerance. So an, an intolerance is not an allergy. With an allergy, with a peanut allergy, we very well trained everybody that the tiniest amount could be life-threatening. I mean, there is a real life-threatening on-the-spot problem for somebody like peanut allergy. That is not applying to celiac disease and that is not applying to wheat intolerance. But for the people with wheat in intolerance, they've taken on these messages of all or none and it's all got to be out of the diet. Um, when people um, feel that they're reacting to wheat, they will open up the food labels of everything that they had and they say, oh, this was made on a line that contained gluten. That's why I'm sick. I must be terribly um, sensitive to gluten. And so it feeds the need to avoid all the gluten. But through my food intolerance side and that study that we did with um, people that I mentioned earlier with my PhD, People on average reacted to five different substances in food that were not gluten. So I would look at what they were just eating in these food labels with a completely different hat on, thinking, you know, you may not be that sensitive to gluten. Many people with an intolerance can get away with little bits. Now, little bits might only be a starch or a little bit might be I can have a bite of bread or I might have one slice of bread sometimes. So that's completely different to celiac disease. So when you do um, read the, the label, if it has been labelled gluten-free, there may be an occasional ingredient that you see. Another one I've seen on a particular type of vegan cheese here is a, a barley starch that it says is gluten-free. So to be on sale here in Australia, there can be no detectable gluten in that product um, and so it would be certified then that that barley starch has been so well washed there's been no gluten in it and then it's been used as an ingredient they told you that it's gluten-free and then the product is gluten-free so um, certainly here we we have very few mistakes if you want to question a product what I, um, and again, from when I used to be with Celiac Australia, what we have always asked people to do is contact Celiac Australia 
with the, prob the product that you have a question about um, and ask them. They may well be able to just say straight off, oh, look, we've gone and we've had this, this yeah. tested and we know it's fine. Or they would say, okay, thanks for bringing our attention to that. And they've got the proper legal team and everybody to deal with and they will deal with it in a, in a way that will be productive. Sometimes when we try to do it ourselves and we want to talk to people, the emotion behind the, the fact that it might be wrong um, can sometimes get a negative response from the person and they'll go, okay, I'm not even going to try anymore, yeah. get, you know, out of my face. So we're much better off letting Celiac Australia deal with it, know how to get a good resolution and then um, move on. We're quite lucky here in Australia, aren't we? Like with our food labelling and everything, it is so safe for us to feel safe and that when, a, like you said, a label says gluten-free, you can be assured that it is gluten-free. Yes. So then I guess the diagnostic timeline, how are you diagnosed with celiac disease? Because I know that there's a few, well, there's probably a lot of people who might have the celiac gene but it doesn't necessarily mean they have celiac. Is that correct? Exactly right, yes. Ideally, you need to have your test before you've even taken gluten out of your diet. Mm -hmm. Now, what is gluten is something that um, I find like the doctor will say, are you eating gluten? And the person says yes. But when they come to me, I don't have such an open question. I say, what were you eating that contained gluten? So if they said to me, oh, and this I get a lot, oh, I had some Cadbury's chocolate and it's got may contain traces on it, or I have a beer once every couple of weeks. The Cadbury's chocolate, you've probably got a 95% chance that there's no gluten in it in the first place. And the beer has so little gluten in it that it's not going to do anything to the gut. So um, there is an idea that the tiniest amount of gluten you have rips the gut out and you've got nothing there. Now, if you don't have gluten in your diet, you've got to think about that statement in terms of this statement. You have to add gluten back and you have to add two, at least two, but up to four slices of bread every single day for six weeks in order to know that when they, they go in with that biopsy, that there's going to be a part of the gut that they take a scrape from that they're going to show that there is celiac disease. Or the bloods can be high enough in order to know, you know that, that we're very likely looking at celiac disease. So with that quantity in mind, you, you, you start to see that this one little molecule of gluten is not going to rip the gut out. But the constancy of that one molecule, that's the problem because it stops things from healing. Yeah. So, so again, no, yeah, sorry, Laura. You keep, no, please keep going. So, number one, if you've got a good quantity of gluten in your diet, you can go straight in for testing. If you don't, you need to add that back. Um, some people find if they buy a vital gluten powder and they have about 10 or 12 grams of that a day, that takes away fructans. Now, fructans is another component that you find in wheat that could lead to symptoms. Wheat's got four different things in it that they're looking at in terms of causing symptoms in people with celiac disease. So if you have a vital gluten powder, you're getting the gluten, but you're not getting that fructan component. And some people might get to their six weeks doing that. All right, so let's take it that we've got enough gluten on board. The next step after that is to have a blood test. Now this blood test is looking to see whether or not there's a chance you have celiac disease. So if um, particular antibodies come back raised, then they're going to suggest that you have a small bowel biopsy. And the small bowel biopsy, so that's the third step, you've still got gluten in your diet. It looks at where the villi are at and do you have nice long villi being normal, not celiac disease, or do you have some degree of damage that's occurred to your villi. And so you've got normal, you'd have a partial villus atrophy, sort of a subtotal villus atrophy and a total villus atrophy. And they tend to be the categories we use here um, in Australia. What um, generally happens after that is suggested that you need to then go on a gluten-free diet. And sometime later, there is a second biopsy, which should be an improvement from where you were 
So it, it's not necessarily that it's going to be normal. Now, that biopsy in the 90s was always done six months later, mm -hmm. but it was rarely normal six months later. And so I've noticed that the gastroenterologists now, they've pushed that out to 18 months or two years because they're trying to see whether or not the villi are more likely to be normal at that point. Now, we've got a study here in Australia that says even five years down the track, 85% of people will fit into that recovered um, category, but some still may not. So the, old, the older you are at diagnoses, the, the flatter you are at diagnoses, the less um, chance that you may get textbook normal gut, but that doesn't mean to say that you don't have good absorption and things that occur, the gut, the, the gut can um, um, help itself, recover itself. Now, then there's this question about, can I be diagnosed by blood alone? Now you brought up the genetic test. Mm. 30 to 40% of the world have these specific gene, um, genes called HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. The official figure is 99.6%, which we round up to 100. So 99.6% of people who have celiac disease have one or both of those genes. Um. So that's why we're saying that if you've got those genetics, you have a chance of having celiac disease, but only 3% of people who have those genetics go on to develop celiac disease. So loads of people around the world do not have um, celiac disease, but have those particular genetics. So if someone has got wheat out of their diet, they don't want to gluten load those two to four slices of bread every day for six weeks, I would suggest that they have the genetic test done. If they don't have the genetics, incredibly small risk they will ever have celiac disease. That's why we kind of use it as you won't develop celiac disease. So you don't therefore have to load gluten back into your diet and have all those tests done. But if you do have the genes, you still need to consider the only way to diagnose celiac disease is to put all of that wheat back into the diet. Some people just, it's, they just can't do that yet. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, a new test being developed in Melbourne. It's not ready yet, but we're all sort of sitting there hoping that when that one comes out soon or when that, sorry, when that one comes out and we don't know when or if or what the, the yeah, status of it is. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it'll only need one meal of gluten. It's not going to need sort of everything that, that we're talking about. Because I guess, because you, you talk about people might develop um, becoming celiac over time. Is that because of the folli? Is it the folli, sorry? Villi. Villi, sorry. Is that because they could start to get damaged and that's how the celiac is then developed? Because okay. some people are fine and then all of a sudden an event or I, I'm not sure how it is, but all of a sudden they're celiac. We used to think you were born with it because we used to think it was a childhood disorder and they grew out of it by teenage years. For some reason, teenagers seem to be able to tolerate some gluten, but then they were finding out maybe even in their 20s and 30s, they were being re-diagnosed with celiac disease. And then we were diagnosing you know, people in there as adults and we were thinking, oh, look, they've had it all their life, but they've only been diagnosed. But they did a study in the 80s where they were looking at family members. So they've actually got a documentation of family members eating wheat with normal villi and then coming back for further research, say 10 years later, and now having celiac disease. And that was able to tell us that you can actually develop it at any stage of your life. So one negative test doesn't mean negative for life either. Mm. So if you've got the genetics um, and, you know, there are 20% of people that don't have symptoms, but let's generally say if you're symptomatic and you've got the, 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 the genetics every five years, if you've got enough gluten in your diet, it's worth having that test done to make sure that, that you're not developing it. But why you develop it, um, again, we've, we've got the, the genetics that's there, but you've got to have something that damages the intestine so this particular enzyme called tissue transglutaminase, it lives in the cells that line the border of the intestine. Usually mm. it's inside a cell. So it, it, it's not going to affect anything that's outside the cell. And the gluten, if it does come in, it's going to be outside the cells. So something has to damage those cells in order to let 
the tissue transglutaminase out, which is why they're looking at gut bugs and giardia and you know antibiotic use and all that sort of stuff as reasons that the cell might break open and then release the tissue transglutaminase. Because once that's done, it then binds with the, um, the gluten that's got through and that then starts to set up damage. Now, damage could happen very, very gradually. Again, you've got that spectrum of people and it may be faster, it may be slow. But because you rarely have a normal before you have a damage, you don't really know how long that process is going to be. In children these days, they have since 2016, they have brought out some guidelines that you have to fulfill particular you know, categories. Your blood line, your bloods have to be very specific in, in particular categories in order for them to diagnose celiac disease without a biopsy. And um, with COVID, we haven't been able to do as many biopsies as, as people would like. And so guidelines are coming out for adults now for this same type of stuff where you if the bloods are very very high um, you may be able to diagnose without a biopsy and although that all sounds good I in speaking with um, some uh, people sort of involved with those tests they were saying the the actual test kits around the world differ so ours are a bit different to where these studies are coming out of of mm -hmm. Europe so it has to be 10 times the upper limit so if the upper limit of your test is 20, then your bloods have to be 200. But sometimes you only get told that it's greater than 100. Mm -hmm. And you actually don't know, is that 120 or is that 500? Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to diagnose by blood. And um, if you've got the biopsy, again, you've got an idea of, of where it started and how much you're recovering. So it's a good idea to have the biopsy, but again, you need to discuss it with your, your gastro. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important that if you are worried, if you have celiac disease, it's so important to partner with the specialist like yourself, with a gastroenterologist, like to get those answers and to have that safe, active recovery after it. Because is there an actual cure for celiac disease? No, there isn't. Um, at this point in time, we don't even have a medication that can help manage it. So right now it's managed solely by diet. So there is no medication. Mm. So I know that there are things that people are looking at, but none of those have translated yet into something that can be effective. And that's why from a psychological perspective, celiac disease takes its toll because you can't just take a medicine and then go out and live your life the way you want to. It's, it's every meal, everything that you put in your mouth. It's every social event. It's, you know, birthday parties. It's religious, cultural events with cultural food that's involved. Um, it's going on a holiday. It's being spontaneous and let's just go here. Let's sort of go into that restaurant and, and, and try it without sort of the vetting of it. It's absolutely every single time something needs to enter the mouth that that somebody needs to be aware and that takes a psychological toll and it's one of the things I am particularly concerned about with sort of this move to zero gluten that we've had um, because um, I, I just see the anxiety around it increasing and increasing and um, it's why, um, you know, I've, um, again, you can cut it. Yeah, that's fine. Whether you want this part. Um, it, it's why I have particularly started talking to people about a product called GluteGuard. But um, I do need to say that I've been talking about GluteGuard for a while, but as of last year, I'm now on the um, medical advisory board for GluteGuard. It is not a medication for celiac disease. It is a tablet that can break down small amounts of gluten. Mm -hmm. It cannot be used to think, I've got a piece of bread here, how many tablets are gonna break it down? There's no guarantee of breaking all of the gluten down. What they um, know is that it will break down some, so it's only suggested use for people with celiac disease is if you're in um, restaurants, you're uncertain of the food. Now you've got to do all your groundwork. You've got to 
put in all the questions to ensure that to the best of your knowledge, they're going to be giving you something that's gluten free. But if um, there was some contamination with something in the background, if you took one of these tablets at the same time, it would break down that little bit of uh, gluten protein that would be there. Um, and you know, its feedback is that certainly from a symptomatic perspective, people are feeling that uh, it's they're less anxious when they're eating out because they're getting less symptoms once they start sort of using that. And so it isn't a medicine for celiac disease. It can be helpful in social situations. And because of this extra burden that people have for everything that they put in their mouth, that's why I like this concept of marrying it when, with something when you're eating out. Um, just to be a little bit more helpful and get you through that situation. Because I also, and I love that point, and I know one of the speakers later on throughout the week will be talking more about the emotional impact because a lot of people don't think about that. It's just like, oh, yeah, you've got celiac disease, but they don't under understand how emotionally it can take a toll on you. And if you're constantly thinking about it, and we spoke about it earlier about anxiety and you can even start to get really um, unsettled, you don't want to go out and your quality of life can change. Yeah, very much so. Um, well, I guess I've got a few before I let you go. I've just got a few more questions for you. And one of them is, what are the common things you need to be careful of that may contain gluten? Just some common ones that people may not know of, such as preservatives or? Um, gluten can be found sort of in many, many things because it's, it's, um, it, it's good at gelling. It's good at a, a sort of a particular type of texture when you've just got it as, as gluten itself. Um, you can find it in in some sausages, you know, in, in preserve, um, processed sorts of meats. Yeah. You can find it as a thickener. In the 90s, people didn't have yogurts because yogurt quite often these days is thickened with a thickener. And that thickener used to be wheat. These days, I haven't really found a yogurt that you can't have because they, they've gone out of their way to make sure that they're putting um, some gluten-free thickeners into those products. Um, so it's there um, as thickness. It can be in gravies and sauces. So when you're out in restaurants, that's why a lot of people just get things minus the gravy or minus the sauce because the wheat starch could be in there sort of just thickening things up. Potato wedges, it could be on. Potato wedges are often yeah. cut and they're rolled sort of in a spice with flour. And when it's deep fried, that flour helps to crisp it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily there in hot chips, but potato wedges is something that people do need to... Um, you know, talk about it can be there in jelly type lollies. So your snakes and um, jubes and that type of thing, it could have a starch that's in it. So that is something that, um, you know, people need to be aware of because it's so easy just to, 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 to grab that. And, the, you know, when you have an M&M &M or, a, or a, a Smartie and you've got that crisp coating that's on the outside, yeah, that crisp coating, it's the wheat starch in, in that that um, it can be found. So again, you need to read those sorts of products. Menthol, sometimes that have that crisp coating, might have it. it you, you need to read the label because sometimes, you know, it won't. But again, in tablets and pharmacy products, if I went back to the 90s, nearly everything had a wheat starch in it. You know, if the tablet, let's take vitamin C. Vitamin C is the medicine but you have this nice round orange tablet. Yeah. So to put the vitamin C into the round tablet, wheat starch was what they called a filler. So it helped to create the tablet. But these days, pretty much everything has gone to a maize starch or they're using something that that's not wheat, but occasionally it can rear its head and it can be there. So there's and, some other things. And that reiterates the importance of if you are have celiac disease like it's so important to go get the help because it's these little things that you wouldn't even think about like you go to get your medication you wouldn't even think that maybe your medication could have a trace of gluten because you're just thinking no I'm taking that to get better and the doctor prescribed it exactly it's always worth just reminding the doctor that you had celiac disease and is that a, a gluten-free medication because he's not just going to remember everything especially if you've come to something that's non-celiac related, he's not necessarily going to remember you're the person with celiac disease. So it's just worth saying when he's prescribing a medication, is that a gluten-free one? Yeah. Well, 
Do you have any other tips, I guess, for someone dealing with celiac disease? I guess, because that was a good tip to ask the doctor or just reiterate to make sure I do have celiac disease. Any other good tips that you find useful? Look, I kind of have a, a list, but um, <laughs> number one, join Celiac Australia. They are a fabulous organisation. They've got a, you know, a handbook can give you lots of tips, but it also keeps you informed on the research because celiac disease is not static. Um, there's been changes since my involvement in the 90s and there's going to continue to be changes. So what I do say, I, I make my changes go with the research, which, you know, is the 10 parts per million, not necessarily just the, the mm. everything sort of at zero. So when the, I look at the, the, um, the average, what majority of people are okay with, um, and not always what is the, the best for the most sensitive. So if I've got the most sensitive, that's what we're going to talk about. Otherwise, for most of my clients, I'm going to talk about what is the average. Um, it's really important to understand the nutrients in a gluten-free diet. There are issues with what do I need in the short term? Now, short term might be two years. If we're talking about this being lifelong, okay, so short term might be two years. What do I need in my recovery, depending on my bloods and degree of my villi damage? And then there's now I'm eating gluten-free. What nutrients in my gluten-free diet do I need to give more concern to for my lifelong diet? Um, and that is going to be slightly different to, to, to everything else. So don't think that you have to just swap wheat for gluten-free. You know, you, we need to get a little bit more creative. We need to use some of the whole grain gluten-free foods and start thinking about we can make some some swaps but we can also deal you know do something else um uh you know in order to sort of deal with it yeah so um home prep i've talked about you know that that glute guard with eating out the more you eat out the the you open yourself to possible contamination and remember i said it's that little bit little bit little bit that's always in the background that's the issue. So if I'm going to run out the door and buy breakfast and then I'm going to go out and buy lunch and then I might get some takeout on the way home, that's three times that day you've already exposed yourself. So if you don't like food, I really encourage you to try to have some sort of input in food prep and prepping something for, for lunches. Have breads and gluten-free bagels and things in the freezer so then if, if you are really caught out and nothing's prepped, You've got some gluten-free bread you can run out the door with and, and you know, even if you just take cheese and tomato with you to put in it, but you might find a salad shop where you can present them with your bread, say, use some clean tongs and let's put something sort yeah. of on the bread. So food prep, eating what you can um, that you have produced. So limit the exposures, but I don't mean limit your social life. Mm. Um, and that's, that's why I you know, talk about that blue card tablet because that can help you then um, with that, that social life, but you have to think about the frequencies. Yeah, I think that's very important. And I guess my last question for you, um, do you get asked a particular common misunderstanding or question in your practice that you can share with us? So is there something that you always see regularly that your clients come in and they may be misunderstood or there's one common question that always gets asked mm. um look i have about three that come up frequently one of them is the wheat glucose syrup yeah and um you know can we really have wheat glu glucose syrup even because it's been derived from from yeah. wheat and the answer is yes the the if there's any protein that's left in the glucose syrup it doesn't and it's mostly used by um, uh, like, I guess, lolly type manufacturers. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do if there's, there's protein in it. So in order for the company to sell its glucose syrup uh, to that big manufacturer, it really has to have the, the you know, the, the no detectable gluten down sort of level in it. And so it's really very, very refined. Um, and so, yes, that is something that you can have. And we, we've just talked about traveling overseas that's another big one um is the traveling overseas um the third one's just escaped me <laughs> that's okay those two ones are really really good thank you 
Well, I think I've already stolen, I think about an hour of your time. I honestly want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from the free from an allergy community for giving up your time today and talking about it. You can see how passionate you are about celiac disease. And I think it just really makes us, especially the community, quite happy. And we feel quite confident that there are so many people out there with such knowledge like yourself who want to help us and who have some answers because it can be quite a lonely journey so it's nice to know that there is help out there and there is a lot of research that is continuing to go on and at the end of the day if you do have celiac celiac disease sorry it's not the end of your life it's just the start of a new exciting journey and you find different things within that so thank you so much for your time today Kim. Oh, you're welcome, Lauren. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to people and um, and be a part of this event. And I was going to say, if people want to connect with you, I know we'll have your area in our exhibitor area if you want to book in a session with Kim. But can we find you on social media? I'll pop all handles underneath this anyway. Uh, yes, I, I'm pretty new to Instagram, um, but I, I have started Instagram now. And I do have my website. Um, what other forms of social media are there? Because I was going to say your Instagram was good because I was looking at it the other day and there were so many helpful tips on there because I saw one about iodine and salt and I was like, I had no idea. <laughs> but I'll pop them all in the description of this video. So if the community want to go explore, um, educate yourself, there's resources out there. So I'll definitely make sure I share all that stuff with them. Um, LinkedIn, sorry, is the other. Bit. Perfect. So that there's the LinkedIn, there's the Instagram and the website. website. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kim. Have a beautiful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, you as well. Bye. Bye, everybody.